start the recording, please? Yeah, started. OK. OK, everybody, thank, welcome to the uh, meeting of the subject, Noble View Scrutiny Committee 3. It's being held at the Gen Civic Centre. It's Monday, the 25th of September. It's, it's 1,600 hours. The meeting is hybrid in the council offices and in, in civic chambers. <coughs> welcome, to, welcome all to the subject of the Scrutiny Committee 3 meeting, which has been convened as a hybrid meeting. The meeting is being recorded and will be available via the Council's website to be viewed subsequently. Everyone participating in the meeting will be accessing it either from the Council Chamber, Civic Offices, Angel Street, Bridgend, or from remote locations. Should I, as Chair, experience any technical difficulties during the meeting, Councillor Colin Davis will step in to take over temporarily as Chair in my absence. And in his absence, Councillor Graham Walter will step in. Please can everyone ensure that mobile phones are switched off or switched to silent mode. <clears throat> Members will have received an electronic copy of the agenda and I will ask officers to present a brief summary of the key points. For the record, the agenda can be viewed on the Council's website. Officers and members are reminded to refer to the page numbers contained within the public version of the agenda report pack. Members and officers will be speaking at various points during the meeting and those speaking may switch their microphones on at that point. But I would ask that with the, with the exception of myself as chairperson, at all times you keep your microphones switched off as this will help to minimise any background noise and interference. However, as a trial measure, I would invite members and officers to leave their cameras on for the duration of the meeting. Whenever attending, whether attending in the chamber or remotely, if any member or officer wishes to raise a point of question, they should click the raise hand icon on the top right hand side of the Microsoft Teams window. I will come to you in the order I receive requests. If you are in the chamber, please switch on the microphone on the desk and speak directly into the mic to allow those who are remote to hear you clearly. Please lower your hand once you have finished speaking. The instant messing chat button has been disabled for this meeting. Please do not use your microphones until I invite you to do so. Officers from scrutiny and will be supporting the meeting and will be monitoring the use of microphones throughout its duration and where necessary will mute those not being used. I will ask officers to introduce themselves when I invite them to speak during the course of the meeting. They too should ensure microphones are switched off when not in use. I will now proceed to the agenda. Item one, apologies for absence. Thank you, Chair. So I've received apologies for absence from Councillor Mike Kern and Councillor Nora Clark. I have one apology from Councillor Colin Davis. He wasn't sure if he could attend. I don't know if he's actually here. You see, you can't see him here. So just note him down for Paul. He may turn up at some point, OK? Uh, Councillor Stephen Bledsoe, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I uh, just need to advance apologise. I'll need to leave the meeting at quarter to six for about ten minutes. That's fine. OK. Don't see anybody. any other apologies. We move on to item two, declarations of interest. Any member, if any member has an interest to declare in a matter on the agenda, please click on the raise hand icon. I will come to you for you to declare your interest. Councillor Spletz again, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. As the Operations Manager for Wales for the National Residential Landlords Association, I'd like to declare a prejudicial interest on any conversations around the report that relates to interaction between the local authority and the private rented sector. It's highly likely that that would uh, cover uh, members that I'm paid to represent. So there is an item uh, in the report which relates about interacting with outside bodies. Um, but also as well, if the conversation moves on to uh, conversations around the private rented sector, I'll need to leave the chamber. Well, you just indicate, you know, obviously that's, we, do, we don't know when that is. So if we indicate, and I, so if I see you leave, just and go on the safe side. Thank you very much. I don't see any other declarations of interest. Approval of the minutes. Can I please have a mover and a second of each set of minutes, please? And there's one set of minutes, I believe. I'm going to be in front of me here. Can anybody move? Have we got a mover? Happy to move, Chair. Seconder, Martin, thank you very much. Lucy, do we get that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, we'll now move on to item four housing support program strategy, homeless strategy 2022 to 2026. Just to let the committee know, I've just been approached by um, officers. They'd like to do a small presentation. Is that correct, Martin? Is everybody happy with that? Because it's not on the agenda. Every, yeah? yeah? I don't think anyone's going to object, Martin. Eh? Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair. Just to, to run through and set the, set the scene in terms of where we are in terms of the housing support programme strategy with regards to the consultation. Yeah. Uh, we, I've got myself, um, Karis, and, and Ryan me today to, to support any questions. Um, in terms of context, in July 2023, Cabinet approved the housing prospectus, the rapid rehousing transitional plan, and the draft housing support programme 22-26. Okay. Uh, the HSB strategy is currently going through the, the 12 week consultation program, which we are hoping you will support that process today. Uh, the housing strategy was developed uh, by an independent consultant. Substantial analysis of various data sets was taken into account and engagement with stakeholders, including individuals who have used the service. It highlights a stark need for increased delivery of affordable housing. Um, in terms of highlighted need, in the last four years, homelessness applications have increased by 25%. In 2020 to 2021, BCBC recorded uh, the number of homeless presentations being 1,612, and this was a record in terms of presentations in that year alone. Temporary accommodation placements have increased by 251% since 2019. Currently, um, we have around about 281 households in temporary accommodation, that, that's equating to uh, 511 persons. And as you see from the housing draft strategy, that's an increase from that previous number. Increasing demand is a factor, but also the legislative change uh, from Welsh Government has meant as an increase in these presentations. Due to the challenges in terms of security move on, the length of households, um, the stay in temporary accommodation has, has dramatically increased during this period. Um, the table in the presentation outlines the temporary cost um, in terms of accommodation. The left down programme was pre-COVID and that was 1920 and the right down column is, um, is um, where we stand today, February 23. My temporary accommodation budget in 1920 was about £135,000. Our projected spend for 23-24 is four million. If you can see in terms of the table, uh, the number of holiday lets Airbnbs have, have, have increased. We have increased um, um, other units in terms of our ABBA, et cetera, but the, the majority has been in the holiday let area to deal with the presentations. So in terms of the common housing register, um, we've seen a 212% increase between March 2020 and February 2023. Uh, as of July 23, uh, we had we have around about 2,629 households. January this year, we had about just under 2,000. So you can see a dramatic increase in that. What are the challenges in terms of the common housing register? Single bedroom accommodations are a key challenge. 51% of that uh, of the applications are looking for a single bed property. We do have challenges also in the the larger family units, four to five, and accessible housing is a key um, barrier for us as we stand. In terms of historical demand, social housing stock has not been sufficient um, to meet uh, common housing register demands. Uh, pr the private rental sector has helped us to meet that need, and it's always been about a 50-50 percentage flip between uh, social housing and common and uh, private rental. But we've seen a, a challenge in the private rental sector. The, the private rental sector's uh, shrinking for a number of reasons. Uh, stagnation and local housing allowance. This is outlined in the table below soaring costs and increased regulation from Welsh Government has seen a number of the, the private rental sector exit the market. Uh, as a desktop evaluation, July 2023, um, if you see below the differential between the average rents and the local housing allowance is significantly across all 10 years, um, making the, the ability to nominate in the private rental sector very difficult in terms of the return on investment for those private landlords. It's not just about uh, accommodation, it's also about support needs. We undertook a study with Welsh Government in um, April 2022 um, and then we reviewed 190 households and temporary accommodation. 53% of those required no or low level support, which is positive, but there's 47% that did. Out of that, 29% of the homeless cases were estimated to have a medium support needs to enable independent living, 14% had high support needs and 4% of the, those households were estimated to require more intensive wraparound support and would benefit from a programme such as Housing First Approach. In terms of tackling um, house, uh, the issue, we have the Housing Support Grant. Uh, the Housing Support Grant service has been vital um, in providing support to mitigate uh, the challenges we have around homelessness uh, accommodation um, requirements. 
Uh, the housing support grant is £7.8 million pounds per annum. Uh, again, as we've seen with the Common Housing Register, we've seen a number of households uh, receiving support increase. Um, we had a 31% increase between 2018 and 21 22, and that's the, i.e., the number of households accessing the housing support grant funded services. In terms of a numeric number, in 21 22, 2,970 households were supported by the housing support uh, fund, which is a significant number for us. Of those support needs, as we looked at in the previous slide, 60% of those households needed one or more support need, 45% needed two or more. So it shows a stark requirement in terms of maintaining that tenancy that in the support needs required by these households. In terms of the social housing grant, uh, the capital allocation process, so uh, the social housing grant is, is the means that we can um, build additional houses. Obviously, Bridgend is not a stockholding or uh, sort of authority, so we, we work in partnership with our uh, RSLs, or registered social landlords, and this is the means of where projects are funded. Um, we've, we've got a what's called a programme development uh, plan, which we're engaging with the uh, registered social landlords, Welsh Government, on a, on a monthly basis. And we, we're looking at means in terms of increasing that social housing grant and, and maximising in Bridgend Borough to bring more houses to alleviate our housing problem. So to give you in terms of our, our spend, the cycles, uh, the spend cycles over a three year period, we're currently in year one of 22 to 25. Um, and we're looking at around about developing around about 400 additional units in this period. I'm going to caveat that because we've got forever changing circumstances. We've seen issues around the Sunnyside uh, development where the actual contractor went into administration, which has paused things. There's cost implications in terms of the cost of living. We've seen house price rises and, and sort of a general inflationary costs is affecting um, any sort of new bills. And then contractor availability. Which is which is very difficult. Is as few contractors chasing many many projects across Wales and in in the in England and Scotland, etc. So the, the 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 table below outlines our social housing grant allocation from 2017 to 2022. So we've gone from 5.4 million up to 9.3 million um, in 22-23. We project is to spend round about 13 million in 23-24 and 24-25. And that's going to bring us in circa between 400 to 600 units. And you know, when you look at our common housing register with 2,600 houses, that doesn't really touch the side. And we got you know 280 odd people or households in temporary accommodation. So it shows a real differential, even with significant investment, is still going to be challenging. I think to give uh, the committees some overview, the, this is uh, the, the current main programme. So we've got a number of, of sites that are in, uh, and currently in development across a number of RSLs, B2C, Link, United Welsh and Wales and Welsh. And th th these are li live programmes of investment going on as we speak. And that's the, uh, the slide two outlining the other, the, the rest of the sort of programme again, you know, B2C, Wales and West, Link, Harvard. Uh, our key sort of registered social lands and other partners, and these are the, these are the ones that are highlighted in that table in terms of delivering those units. In terms of need, the local development plan is where we determine need, and that is fed in via the local housing market assessment, and that informs the LDP in terms of uh, need. The local housing market assessment was published in 2021, and that determines the level type of housing needs per annum, both numerically and spatially. Um, the local housing allowance, the local housing market assessment is is de developed as a statute requirement, and we're looking to uh, submit a further one in 2024, and that's done by our planning in committees, in communities there. There's also the urban capacity study support this as well in terms of non-allocated sites the, with, within the settlement boundaries that could use a windfall. So it taking the, the LDP takes account of the local housing market assessment as well as the urban capacity study in, in terms of identifying need. I've taken this extract from the LDP for 2018 to 33, and that shows that the number of affordable housing units has been earmarked for, for that period. So quite a quite a long period, obviously, 18 to 33, and it's the total aggregate of 977 units. And again, reflect back our common housing register in terms of where we are. It's, although it's going to eke into it, that's one third of where we are at the moment, probably today. Um, or as we're where we are today, because we've got the consultation, it's on the website. We're going to asking you to um, support us in the housing support program strategy in terms of 22-26. 
and also our action plan. So, you know, this is available on the website We're in the middle of uh, that consultation. Um, it's closing dates of 12 October, and hopefully today is going to support us in terms of uh, that consultation and where members can feed into that. So, if it's possible, Chair, just outline the, the six draft priorities of the housing support programme. So, strategic priority one is increase the supply of affordable accommodation. Two is to implement the rapid rehousing transitional programme. Our plan that that's to support the movement of people out of temp or households out of temporary accommodation into more um, stable uh, accommodation. Strategic three, which is provide an accessible, flexible, responsive service to meet the needs for skilled and valued workforce. Strategic priority four is to improve the collaboration with key stakeholders at the strategic level to improve homelessness prevention. Strategic priority five is to enhance and increase the service for those with complex needs. And then strategic priority six is to take an assertive, collaborative, multidisciplinary approach to support rough sleepers, which is a key remit of Welsh Government's uh, policy. So in terms of the consultation, I, Chair, I was wondering if we could go through the questions um, in that to add some, add some value and then we can feed back and then take further questions when we complete it, if that's possible. So the, the first consultation question is, do you agree with the strategy aim and as we're asking members to work in partnership with the stakeholders to prevent homelessness, ensuring where prevention is not possible, homelessness is rare, brief and un, unrepeated. Those who access the service will be given support, required to live as independent as possible. And that's our key strategic aim for the consultation. So. Yeah. Is that, that or? Question no, two is. Right. I don't know. Go you're going to go through every question. I'd in, like in, to, if we could, possibly, we can capture. No, that's, that's fine, yeah, yeah. You don't want, you don't want us to make a decision, you know, just, just, just to get. No, the whole point of the, 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 the today's meeting is to have the, have the consultation so we engage with, listen to the views, and, and then we can inform that because we, we are in that draft, that process. So, you know, any feedback is where we want to be. And these are the, these are the key questions, the seven questions the okay, public. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have so if we we could so take views from from across the floor if possible. Okay, yeah, yeah, go on, yeah. Do, do you want to do for, for each? You're going to do that for each question as you go along, yeah. Has I, anybody got any? So we want to ask the, the committee now to comment on this question, yeah. If it's possible, yes. Yes, fine, yeah. Anybody got? A, anybody want to come in with a comment on question one of the consultation? Anybody? Councillor Metzo. Um, I think, I mean, if we're going to do that, uh, it depends on which way you want to do that. But I, I mean, I would support this because that's Welsh, Welsh Government policy, isn't it? That's, that's the actual wording that Welsh Government use. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't look to change that at all. Is there anybody against that uh, aim? That's an easy way to ask. <laughs> Councillor Melly Evans, please. Yeah, thank you, um, Chair. Firstly, I would obviously definitely re um, support this aim. I would question, and um, that may come later on, the how we're going to achieve it, but I agree with the, the aim. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Evans. Okay. Yeah, Mark. So I think it's pretty overwhelming the support for the actual uh, strategy, Mark. I think it's fair to say. Come on. Thank you, Chair. That, that, that's, that's good to you as a start of the 10. So. On to the from your mind. Yeah, right? I don't know. Is it, I think we go in the right direction anyway. So, so question two is: Does the housing support program strategy clearly explain what challenges the council faces in delivering the homelessness and housing support services? And I, I tried to capture that in the presentation of the stark reality we are. So, I guess we're asking members. So, does the strategy outline that? Well, the report certainly does. I, I would, I would say, yeah. There's, you know, it's no, there's no sort of doubt in the difficulties, isn't there? With the figures you gave us, uh, anybody want to come in and uh, with a comment? Comes to bed, so. <laughs> uh, just on that, I think as a committee, I think we'll be able to build on those challenges. I think a few of the councillors have picked up quite a lot of things, and we've all got personal experience from yeah. that. And uh, the, my only caveat to that was that I don't perhaps feel it goes far enough in addressing the challenges, and that is kind of a question because. The, 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 the report it actually starts from 2022. I think things have got a lot worse uh, since then. So I think as a, as a committee, we're probably going to build up on the challenges rather rather than saying there are no challenges. We're probably going to uh, recognise them more. But to answer the question here, I think we do we do see you know the, the challenges and how stark they are, Martin. I think it's fair to say. Yeah, um, I think everyone would agree with that. Uh, anyone who disagrees, might don't don't feel free to put your hands up and come in. But I don't see any hands up, Martin. Go on, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so the, the next one is, do you agree with the council's strategic priorities and the objectives as set out in the strategy? So was I've that been, the six points at the end, Martin? That's the six yeah? points, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Debbie Thomas, external. Is this um, our invitee from 
Do you want to say, Elizabeth? Um, I'm from Crisis. I'm head of policy for Wales at Crisis. Okay, I don't know whether, as an external, did you want me to comment at the end, or are you happy for me to comment alongside council members? No, this is a consultation open to anybody, uh, Debbie. So, um, so yeah, quite away. Lovely. Well, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, and yes, so I agree with introduce that. Introduce yourself again, Debbie, because I wasn't sure you were. So just sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, so I'm I'm Debbie Thomas. I'm head of policy for Wales at Homeless Charity Crisis. Right. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Um. So thank you for having me along today and i agree with what the what the others have said on the first two questions i think that the strategic um aim is right and it links with with what the welsh government aims are of rare briefing and and, and um unrepeated which is absolutely right that you should do that and i think kind of the mention of drawing in stakeholders is right as well as is um living independently so i, I think that's a, a really strong really really good aim um, and I think that you do set out a lot of what the challenges are. There's a lot of data in there, which is is, is really good as well. Um, I think in terms of strategic priorities and objectives, um, you, I think you're definitely in the right direction as far as I'm concerned. Like you're you're hitting all the, all the main points that that we always talk about in terms of early prevention, um, multidisciplinary working. Um, I just think I think one of the members touched on it earlier that I feel that. Actually, the detail, the devil is in the detail, and a lot of the detail isn't isn't quite there in terms of the report. Really identifies um, what some of the challenges are, and not all of those are mapped clearly into succinct actions. So, for example, the accessibility question, it's it's not really clear how you're how you're going to meet that. Um, and then in terms of these the actual strategies, I think um, that the six priority points, I think they're right. Um, the only thing that I would say is we agree that rough sleeping is the most acute end of homelessness and does need a targeted response. But um, I do think that you've outlined multidisciplinary, outlined, um, multidisciplinary um, approach for that objective but I would really strongly say that actually multi-agency working is really important on the preventative side as well um, as working with with rough sleepers so whether um whether you could embed that in within the other priorities as well I think that would be quite helpful thank you okay well you, you come back and ask questions later as well on this if you want to Debbie obviously you know you're, you're in the meeting you may as well <laughs> <laughs> lovely thank you I, I got thank you for that I've got councillor Melanie Evans next, please. Yeah, thank you. And um, I would absolutely agree with um, Debbie in what she have said. For me, the objectives are not detailed enough and I question whether they are smart enough. Um, and I think that basically um, uh, there'll be questions perhaps later on where perhaps some of the questions um, that I bring to the table may bring that to fruition for people's understanding. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Evans. Right, there's, do you want to come back on that, Martin? Anything, or is, is uh, no... Yes, please. Yes, if I yes, could, yeah. uh, you know, th thank you, Debbie, for your feedback. In terms of the accessibility, if we're talking about uh, adaptations and, and houses in terms of that, that element, um, we, we're obviously not a stockholding organisation, but what, as I mentioned there, in terms of new builds, etc., money coming to the authority via Welsh Government, the social housing grant, we work in partnership with the registered social landlords and one of our key drivers on the, on the programme development plans is accessibility. So, you know, any new schemes going forward, we're asking the question, any ground player access, and can we develop that accessibility question? So that, that's at the forefront for, for us on that perspective. I totally agree with you in terms of the multi-agency, some, some of the wording we, we can definitely change around that. We work with our third sector partners, Wallach, Pobble, etc., in terms of, of that multi-agency approach and, and the predominantly around 70% of our uh, housing support grant goes to the third sector. So we, we're a key driver from that aspect. Um, and in terms of response to objectives being smart. I think the action plan is a starter for 10 for us, but this is, a, this is a work in progress in terms of identifying need and moving forward. So the action plan is where we want to be, and that's where we can apply some smart level elements, but also support going forward. But it's an iterative process in terms of moving forward. So we, we don't have all the answers today, but we're going to be working towards that. Do you, do you want to take the next, next question of the consultation, Martin? 
Yeah. The next one we've got is question four, and all these questions that you know the, the general public uh, when they uh, will see and, and respond to, which is which is really positive. So thank you for your time. So is there anything missing from the housing support program strategy that you would like to see include? And I appreciate we just touched on the multi-agency element and for for uh, for Debbie, but is there anything missing? Does anybody want to add to anything for this question, Councillor Phil Jenkins, please? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, on the action plan are based, you know, the, the six priorities, etc. You you touch on the subject of support for rough sleepers, uh, etc. Has the Bridgen County Borough Council have uh, uh, an overnight accommodation for rough sleepers, uh, you know, um, so that we can take them? Obviously, we are working towards rehousing, etc., giving permanent homes, particularly the uh, the need for one bed properties, etc. But what is a what is a strategy or the detail in the strategy? It just says take an assertive, collaborative, multidisciplined approach to support rough sleepers. Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, would Bridgen County better consider having one of the, the empty properties converted into a, an overnight accommodation for X number of persons? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jenkins. There's two two questions Ellie picked up. Um, I want to the repeat. Did, did you get them, Martin? Yeah, you did. Uh, th thank you, Councillor Jenkins. Uh, yeah, so, so quite quite a long uh, sort of question from that perspective. But yes, our housing support grant supports rough sleeping. We've got numerous services with the third sector. We run a three six five support service, which will go out and and engage with our rough sleepers. Where we stand today, anyone who requires accommodation, we will accommodate. You know, so that, that's that's a key key criteria. I, I will add, there is a choice around this. There's a number of, of persons will will choose to sleep rough, and, and that's their decision. But we will, everything is always open and transparent. We keep on engaging. Our breakfast run, our staff via the the, the Wallace uh, program will support us. Um, but there is a choice as well. So you know. Ryan can go through some of the other provisions we've got in terms of facilitating support in our rough sleeper community, but there is a choice, and we do find it quite difficult sometimes. Can I come in quickly? Yeah. Isn't it legislation from Welsh government that's uh, you're not allowed to? If, if, you've got a, if, if someone presents, you have to. That's right, isn't it? That's the key change to the legislation yeah. during COVID. Is no one's left out. So, right. and that was obviously um, an emergency legislation at the time, and now they've uh, sunk it into the into the act now, right. which is which make, gives a differential and gives us a uh, certainty as an authority where we can start planning longer term. Yeah. Um, the difficulty has been quite short term, but now I'll give Ryan can give an overview. Can of some I ask of the one very quick question there. When he brought when he cemented that into legislation, did they increase the funding towards it? Because obviously there's a cost, a huge cost to the authority there, isn't it? Did did they back that up with any sort of money or was that um you know. We have seen some rises in terms of a housing support grant, but as you could see from the figures on the temporary accommodation, we have facilitated and supported additional monies, but internally through um, budget pressures, um, and, and that, that's the biggest concern, as you saw, of my temporary housing accommodation, one, one 135000 to £4 million as yeah. we stand today. So there has been support from Welsh Government definitely through the COVID period with numerous grants coming in to support that. But now we're in a position now we've got to become self sufficient and sustaining. And then you end up we haven't defended, okay. But we we do know where we are now. Where we before was under emergency legislation, we Indeed, didn't know which yeah. way it was gonna go and now it's in act. Yeah. Now we now can we now start that. planning and, and being sort of in, innovative in terms of our approach to bringing our numbers down. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ryan would recommend you, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, do you want to introduce yourself first? Yeah, sorry, uh, Ryan Jones. I forgotten to, uh, I sorry, uh, Ryan Jones, the Commissioner Manager for Housing and Homelessness in Bridgen Council. Okay. Um, so just to follow on from Martin's, um, what Martin's already said, really. So, when we talk about Strategic Priority Six and the support of rough sleepers, we're, we're not really talking about those who are in temporary accommodation. Despite the legislative change, despite the numbers and the funding we've all talked about in terms of. Uh, the temporary accommodation figures that there remains rough sleepers um, in the grand scheme of things a very small number um, but nevertheless th th there remain rough sleeping um, in the county uh, as they do in other counties across Wales so uh, and there's very often very kind of complex and multifaceted reasons as to why someone may be rough sleeping Martin talked about choice there's often quite complex support needs um, that come along with that choice as well um, when we talk about this this priority and the kind of 
the assertive outreach and the and the multidiscipline and we talked earlier about it being a multi-agency approach which absolutely it is it's about trying to to build relationships trying to build engagement with those individuals and trying to encourage um those individuals to engage with services and then ultimately access accommodation um quite often it's not as simple as uh, as merely providing bricks and mortar for, for for individuals who are rough sleeping there's there's other kind of background support needs that, that quite often need to be addressed and, and a lot of that does rely upon engagement from the individuals. Um, so I suppose when we talk about this this priority in particular, that's what we're talking about. It's about how we can continue but also enhance those services which try to encourage people into services and ultimately into accommodation on a, on a short and then longer term basis. Thank you very much. Uh, um, it's, it's Debbie Thomas, please, external. Hey, Debbie Thomas from Crisis again. Um, there's a few things I wanted to say in response to this question. And the first one is what is there? And what's there is, is some really good stuff. Like, I don't want to take away from that at all. Like, you have identified some really key things that need to be addressed. Um, in terms of what's missing, for me, it comes back to what I was saying earlier in terms of the detail. I think um, some, some of the flesh and the bones about what actions look like and, and what they are would, would be welcome some more detail on that. I think in particular, um, for ex I've got a few examples, so in particular around supply, so the document's really clear about where the supply is lacking in terms of single um, bedroom properties and also in terms of four, five bedroom properties and whether the detail around how you look into address those particular gaps in supply would be, would be really welcome. I think other, other areas um, in particular where, where more detail would be welcome would be around um, person-centred planning. I know that was identified by the um, people with lived experience that you spoke to. Um, so kind of actions around how, how you're going to, to look at that would be would be really welcome. Um, and as would kind of trauma-informed approach, I think it would, be, would be fab. Um, and then also looking at um, retention of accommodation. So, so moving upstream and helping people to, to retain accommodation um, would be helpful. So some, some more actions around that. But like I say, I don't want to take away from what's there because you have it on, on a lot of the, the key areas that, that do need addressing. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, John. Thanks for that. Um, Councillor Jonathan Pratt, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, to the question, um, is anything missing? I'm not sure it's missing, but it's not very, it's not been elaborated on. Um, housing for our armed services veterans uh, and this caused a plethora of, um, of, 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 um, of situations, you, you know, someone who's packed their bags, um, left their, left their parental home or a rented, rented home, to go to training, drops out of training, no longer part of the um, military anymore and looking to get back home, whether that's effectively homelessness or not. Um, if anyone had been injured in service, wanted to come back to a place which is home where, they, where they've where they lived but haven't been here for a reasonable amount of time to someone who served a long and successful career in the military and, and, and can't find a property once they've left so it, it's it's in the report that says that the local authority needs to be aware of um the welsh government's commitment to um housing veterans but doesn't really go into a lot of detail as to how um and it just sort of it does seem i i don't want to um have a go at the report but it in my view, it seems to be, well, there's a footnote, we've mentioned them, um, but that's it. So it, it's, um, I, I, I hope that view yeah. is wrong from me, just wanted to see what what is out there for veterans, okay. I suppose. So I you, will sir. let Martin come back on that in a minute. I, I didn't, did Debbie ask, actually ask a question when she spoke and I missed it there? So can, can we go back to that first, Martin, to answer Debbie's question then? Answer Jonathan's question on the on the veterans, please. My mistake. Thank you, Chair. I thought you were going to line me up there. So, Debbie, I tried to capture in terms of the, the supply you, you talked about. That's what I talked about in the in the presentation about the social housing grant. We non-stock holding. 
So we're working well with Welsh Government to bring money into the authority to, to actually build new accommodation. So it was 9.5 million uh, for the first year and we got 13 million for the next two years. So that's, that's where we're going to increase our supply and that's our focus. Uh, you're talking circa 400 to 600 units uh, in terms of housing and that's where aspects such as the larger homes and uh, single bed accommodation will, will be dealt with because we look at the local housing market assessment and determina determination of need. We also, there's other funding provided through Welsh Government Transitional Capital where we are looking to uh, spot purchase via RSLs, opportunities that can facilitate things like accessibility, etc. So there's lots of means and availability. It's just the quantum versus the, the, the numbers on the common housing register is the challenge really, if I'm being open and transparent. So I hope that answers that. In terms of the, the person-centred approach, Ryan's going to come on there and retention. We've got numerous schemes that we support by the housing support grant in terms of third sector provision is to, to, to provide an, that tenancy retention and working with those, those, those persons or households who are struggling. So that's, that's throughout that £7.8 million pound we're working with, it, with the, the third sector to provide that. But do you want to talk about the person-centred approach? Thanks. Right. Yeah, um, just coming in on that, um, so the housing support grant, as we touched on and, and is referenced throughout, is is a lot of it was the largest funding stream that um, we're talking about. That's going to fund a lot of the the kind of actions that are set out in the action plan at, at Appendix Two. Um, person centred approach uh, is is key to the to the housing support grant ethos and the the services delivered, set up with Welsh government guidance, etc. I think we could probably reflect that a bit stronger in terms of the actual action plan. But if we go to the action plan, there's quite a bit there, and particularly in terms of the action set up and the pr priority four. Um, so perhaps we could specific, make specific re reference to person-centered approach there. Um, there we are. Okay, and um, also similarly in terms of moving the prevention upstream, we've got a few uh, actions there, particularly at strategic priority four and appendix two. Um, and I think Martin's just going to come in on the quiz on the armed forces. If that's Thank okay. you very much, Martin. Martin, could you just introduce yourself at this late stage? Because I didn't, I don't think you did what at the beginning to do. My, my, again, my mistake. With those. It, it was on our presentation. So Martin Moore's head uh, of partnerships. I introduced both Ryan and and, yeah, and Carlos that time. Yeah. So yeah. You know. <laughs> Just, that, just thank you, Chair. I, I think just Chair recognition as well. The action plan is the what our our plan in terms of how we're going to address and implement the strategy. I think you know members need to be aware that that's where the the meat and the the smart objectives are in terms of of the housing support strategy. So that was the additional document as part of that process. I think uh, Councillor Pratt at a, at a good point in terms of the armed services. When we look at statement and need, our numbers are very low in the authority, but I do think we can take that on board and strengthen the housing support strategy in terms of the the veterans and armed services so you know welcome that sort of uh, sort of uh, sort of amendment okay thank you uh, councillor Melly evans next please yeah thank you uh, chair and uh, firstly can i can i say also that obviously there's been a lot of time and work put into this action plan and i do appreciate the amount of time and work that has actually put into implementing or, or bringing it forward today for me, what I think is missing, I can see that you've actually set out in the plan columns for objectives, actions, responsibilities and timescales. However, I cannot see a column for the measurements. So for me, it's all about the how and as I've said about the detail. So things like how are you going to measure the progress of the plan? What are the measurements? measures of individual objectives, what data will be used to measure objectives, how often will the data be analysed, how are you going to ensure every objective and timescale is achieved? And I think, I, I mean, I can go on. So I think what would be useful is basically if you had a column for the measurements of the plan, which you would find some of the actions and the data would be listed in the measurements. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Evans. Martin, do you know? Was that one question or six? I'm not quite sure. But, uh... Thank you, uh, Councillor Evans. I think we, we de definitely could put some uh, a column in there in terms of uh, some timelines, etc., and take on board the, the comments from from the member. So that we'll we'll work to get that to get that smart, measurable sort of uh, objective. Uh, you know, this is the whole point of the consultation is to listen to what yeah, the views, etc. So yeah, we'll t take that on board and work something in in terms of obviously the strategy is going to be submitted to Welsh government is. 22 to 26 and that's the timeline we'd like to work towards 
and um, probably extend over because we because of the issues we had with COVID is mitigate us again that approval. But yes, that'll be the it's a four year program of works really in in terms of a, a time when we just need to be be a bit smart in terms of those okay. options. So thank you. Um, Councillor Martin Williams next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it it uh, it was came up in conversation then with a couple of people that that there's effectively a market failure insofar as there's not enough provision of of one bedroom. Um, one bedroom accommodation, which is perhaps what what, what is required um, more than more than anything else at the moment. Uh, it was discussed uh, um, that we would be working with RSLs and using the government grant through the RSLs and, and, and spot purchasing through the RSLs. And, and it has also been mentioned a number of times that we're not a stockholding authority. Why aren't we? And, and why are we using a middleman? Why why aren't we thinking more like a developer and potentially? spotting this market failure we have perhaps access to land that ourselves don't or, or others in a, in a, in in this sort of commercial world we'd be looking at margin on margin so we so why are we paying others to do what we could potentially do ourselves perhaps plug that gap and then roll the properties on in a few years and, and sell them on and, and in the meantime we've created the properties and if necessary if we if, if it's not in our long-term interest to be a property or a stockholding authority we 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 fix the problem and then we roll it on for someone else to, to take on it at a later date just wondering your views on that councillor good please uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Councillor Good. I'm the Cabinet Member for Housing Plan and Regeneration. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Councillor Williams. I think uh, I think we need to be thinking more about outside the box of how we move forward in terms of our housing strategy. Uh, we aren't a uh, property owning authority anymore, but that is something I think we do need to start looking at more widely. It's obviously not an easy option to go back to become an authority. That owns property, which is something that I've started to explore with colleagues across um, other cabinets in South Wales who are, who are in similar situations, actually, in other authorities where they equally find themselves in very difficult situations <coughs> and that sometimes RSL partners can't deliver or, or find it difficult to deliver what is actually needed for the population and the type of housing we require. Um, I think there is something to be said for uh, being cautious with that. Obviously, we don't have the expertise in-house anymore compared to what we did when we had the stock transfer. Uh, but we are, and, and I have asked the team to start looking at finding ways that we can start owning again. I think we have to be very uh, purposeful in that and be very cautious not to sort of run before we can walk. Um, but I think there's also something to be said for um, finding the right support within RSLs to deliver on these housing challenges. It does concern me and it does frustrate me that our RSL colleagues have been told repeatedly that what we need is one beds and they are not seemingly interested in one beds. Now, that is understandable. They, they, you know, it, it is very difficult to break even on a one bed for an RSL and I understand that. But at the end of the day, RSLs are there as registered social landlords, and they do have a duty to do that. And there is definitely ways that they, as, as um, you know, Councillor Williams will understand, there are ways that they could set their portfolio to make, make space for that. And I think we do have to have that serious conversation with RSLs, something myself, Karis and Martin are having regularly with RSL partners to get them to understand that this isn't us sort of flippantly saying this is what we need, this is what our borough needs, and we need to find ways of doing that. So uh, we are looking more widely in a longer term way at what we can do in terms of perhaps looking for maybe owning some temporary accommodation or other uh, short term accommodation with potentially third sector partners to deliver some in-house um, properties owned by the borough uh, while we try and work with our RSL partners to deliver a better mix of housing, because I think that is something we, we really need to look for. Okay. Um, I, I bring you back in, Mark. Can I bring Martin back in first? Two Martins. <laughs> is that right, Martin? You, you, you put your hand back up, or is that the... I'll bring you back in now, because it's, it's, it's quite a good answer I thought you gave there, so it'll be... It's in, Martin, uh, Martin Morgan, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to reflect on the action plan on priority one, page 41 of the pack, to explore new ownership models for affordable housing is, is our view in terminal officer, just to reflect what uh, 
Councillor Good was saying there, we try to capture that as, you yeah, know, as a that function. Point, that's point now to address. Councillor, can you come back, Councillor Williams? Yeah, thanks, and thanks for that, Anson. It, it is heartening to hear that, that we're thinking more yeah. broadly. I, I was going to talk about, um, ask questions about emergency housing, perhaps later on in this session, so I'll leave that for now. But it's interesting, isn't it, that, that the RSLs are perhaps not don't have the appetite for the, the one bedroom properties because they feel they can't make the necessary margin on it. And then I would suggest, and I don't think I, I don't think I can have disagreement, although it might it might not be um, it might not be explicit agreement, that if they want to play in the commercial environment, that maybe they, they become fully commercial um, uh, entities and, and, and perhaps we, we um, fill the gap in another way because you know there's a bit of cakeism here, isn't there? Yes, okay, yeah, agree, can't disagree. Okay, Martin. Uh, oh, there's a few hands up here now. Um, Debbie Thomas, please. Hi, thanks. Um, thanks for your answers to, to my questions earlier. There, there was one in there which I, I probably didn't outline clear enough, and I'm sorry about that. So, um, basically, um, Crisis has recently been involved in a piece of work. Um, looking at legislation in Wales for, um, for the Welsh Government and there was a lot of work done speaking to experts by experience across the country as part of that and what came back really strongly from people with lived experience was that they found access in the systems really difficult and that there was a really strong call from them for, for the systems for, for actually systems themselves um, to, to be more accessible, to be more in tune with communication needs, um, neurodiversity needs, um, and also to be more trauma informed as well. Um, and this isn't for gen specific, this is national feedback that, that we were that we were taking. But I see that some of that also seems to have come through in in your own consultation work with, with people with lived experience. And I was wondering how that kind of trauma informed and accessibility aspect of, of the housing option service itself um, features with, within this plan. Oh, it is, yeah. Thank you, Debbie. Really, really um, sort of up this sort of question in terms of that. From our perspective, um, we, we, we've obviously looked at the need in terms of the, the the service user. We've we've done some pilot programs in terms of across the, the CTM area, and uh, w one of the biggest issues we had is obviously is, is a multifaceted issue in terms of challenges with I mean drugs, alcohol, and mental health. Um, and Ryan was an architect uh, in terms of provisioning across CTM, the Comtaf Organo Health Board that covers Rombican and Taff and Murtha, in terms of a, a team that provides our services directly to those service users, which is something we picked up. I think you know your point's really well made on on that aspect, and, and I don't know if you talk about some of the other things we facilitated, Ray. Right? Yeah, thank you, uh, Martin. I, it's it's a good point you make, and I suppose. The key thing for us is this isn't just about the local authority delivering upon these actions, is it? It's about our partners, whether they be statutory partners, whether they be third sector partners. A, a lot of the uh, homelessness and housing support landscape in Bridgend is actually delivered by third sector partners through commissioned providers. Martin mentioned a couple of them earlier, Wallach, Pobo, Hamai, etc., some of the biggest in, in Bridgend. And through kind of commissioning contract and arrangements, we we expect those services as well as our own services to be delivered to be delivered in a trauma informed approach um all staff have gone on training etc around aces for example psychologically informed environments that that sort of approach and again it's going back to what the, the ethos of the housing support grant and the kind of guidance is built around the housing support grant um so i think it's the point is valid and it's, it's completely across the board isn't it it's not just about housing option services and someone coming in it's about how we how we do that in every service we deliver and i think it's just about kind of embedding that culture across all services and how, how we do that both internally and with our commission providers uh, martin touched upon the the health outreach team and i suppose that's just one example of, of where we tried to enhance um a trauma-informed approach and a specific multi multidisciplinary approach to uh, rough sleepers and, and those in temporary accommodation essentially taking uh, mental health and substance misuse services as well as general uh, nurse provision out to rough sleepers trying to engage with individuals um, rather than expect people to come in I suppose to uh, to general health health services or to general housing services so that's just one example but but yeah it's something that needs to be embedded across across the board 
Thank you, Ryan. Um, Council, I'm not going to bring you back in now, David, because we have several hands up. Okay, so, um, Councillor Bed, so please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, record. I've had a message from Councillor Ian Williams. He's had a bug all day. He's not feeling very well. He's left the meeting. It's noted. Thank you. Um, Councillor Graham Walter, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, I was um, listening with interest to what um, Councillor Good said and um, you know, fully uh, have faith in him and Martin to have the right conversations with the RSLs around this issue of uh, um, single uh, single person properties. Um, I was quite interested to hear the words, there's no margin in it for them. I'm, I'm not sure that the people waiting for those properties would quite like um, quite, quite like it if they knew that their um, potential landlords saw it that way. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, if the, the conversations that Reese and so I guess my question is to is to Councillor Good and, and to Martin, um, are they fulfilling their mandate, um, our RSLs? Um, what sort of escalation process is there to apply the right pressures in the right places so that we can see a marked shift in their um, ability to match demand to need? Thanks, Chair. Okay, uh, Councillor Good, please. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Walter. Um, look, I think no RSLs are the same. They all are very different and they all perform in very different ways. Um, I certainly have some concern with some of our larger RSLs operating within the borough. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that many sticks with which to go and seek change in their procedures. Um, in England, there is an ombudsman for RSLs. Um, Wales does not have an ombudsman. The ombudsman is the minister. Now, I am exploring, and, and in fact, Martin and I spoke earlier today about trying to find out the, the route or the best route to, to access that and, and how that actually works in terms of the minister's responsibilities uh, and then what they can actually do to uh, facilitate change. Uh, I think, you know, one, one of my big concerns is looking at the boards of, of RSLs that operate within our borough. Um, there was a decision taken by many of them uh, following, I think, legislative change, in fact, a few years ago to change the makeup of their boards so that they are, um, as they put it, uh, uh, skills based boards, as opposed to boards that had representation from local authorities or in my view, more importantly, far more importantly, from tenants. Now, one of our biggest RSLs, um, the stock transport RSL, Valley Sea Coast, uh, will tell you that they have a tenant on their board. They have one tenant and he is not there as a voice of tenants. He is there as a board member. Now, I'm sure that person has a lot of skills in housing, and I think that's really important, but it must not be forgotten that the primary role of yeah. these organizations should be to deliver housing to people in social need and yeah. it does concern me that we don't have enough of a voice on those boards and they are essentially being run uh, uh, around margins as, as councillor williams notes and that is really concerning i think we do have to look for changes there to make sure that these organizations are understanding their wider responsibility within our communities because i think at the moment it seems to me a lot of them when there's pressure and they do have pressure don't get me wrong they have as much pressure as we do in terms of funding yeah. but they have a, a role to play and the reason that rsls and stock transfers existed was to help create and improve housing for people within our borough and if that's not happening at the moment, then we need to find ways to make that clear to them. And currently, I, I don't think we've quite found that way. As, as I've said to the chair of the committee previously, one of the only sticks we do have is to call them in front of scrutiny. And I know that is now on the forward work programme. And I think that is really important. I really urge all members of this committee to make sure that when you have that opportunity, you ask these very deep questions about their purpose and how they see their priorities, because sometimes I do worry that they've maybe mixed their priorities up. Thank okay, you. Thanks ever so much. Appreciate that. Martin, did you happy with that? 
I think from an officer perspective, obviously I'm working very hard with uh, RSLs in terms of driving yeah. the, the, the social housing grant into this area to meet the need, and the need is based around the, the common housing register, along with the local housing assessment, you know, which we determined. And and w when you're looking at the social housing grant, there's, a, there's normally a 58 to 60 percent Welsh government uh, element, and the rest has to be through private equity through the RSL. And that, that's got to be geared around our needs. So we're driving very hard operationally from an officer's perspective, you know, taking on priority when we're looking at all opportunities. So engaging in, in, in what Councillor Williams mentioned in terms of what land we've got available. So just to drive up the possibilities. So I'm working hard with, within the community directors from that perspective. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Just for clarity, um, it's not on the full work program at the moment. Um, it, we did do RSLs back in, back in November. Well, the committee decides not to, I'm afraid, not the uh, cabinet member goes on the forward work plan. And we'll be discussing that um, at the end of this meeting, <laughs> just to let you know. Um, I'm going to take Phil Jack. It's count, we've got to move on here because it's, we don't know question four. Councillor Betso, do you need. Councillor Phil Jenkins, please. Thank you, Steve. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, you Chair. Uh, basically, whilst well, I listen to the cabinet member, I don't su subscribe entirely to uh, his train of thought because obviously I can remember the uh, quite successful um, Ogwabara Council who made a considerable amount of money out of his old housing stock. It was uh, what led to his demise, was, which I don't want to debate now, was obviously uh, the way they used the profit from that um, margin and the combination of legislation. But uh, I would like to ask, um, you know, the use of a compulsory purchase to help alleviate, although there can't be a, a massive amount of it there, it's significantly I throw the better, though we could be using um, our powers, compulsory purchase. Now, we have, the, have this latest grant around the grants based upon its um, a vibrant town centres, etc., where there's considerable um, sections up to £30,000 for feasibility, up to another £50,000 for conversion and helping, you know, on each individual application, the way I read it. So would, even though the authority is not, I'm going to say, a, a housing stockholder at the moment, should we compulsory purchase? Could could the town or could the council make use of those grants themselves? Because there are, as I mentioned earlier, as we discussed, a number of landlords out there who are content to leave their buildings just falling down and in a terrible state. And um, it takes decades for us to take action. And in fact, the one in Commercial Street in my state, there is no action being taken. Um, to my knowledge, and I think that perhaps we could uh, um, deal with that uh, in a basis if if it was, you know, if we had the legalities to be able to do so. And my second question briefly again is, I just noted, as I said, I don't know if, whether my fellow councillors wanted it, but based to the officers, the housing support grant allocations, um, we are going up now. We, we, you've indicated from year 22, 23, 23, 24, and 24, 25. And given the significant pressures that we're seeing placed upon our authority and officers, uh, that grant hasn't risen at all uh, and is stagnant. When, in fact, given the inflation and uh, other outlying factors, it would be, in fact, decreasing while our needs and aims would be increasing. So I'm wondering if they could uh, answer that, please. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jenkins. Um, this point, you mentioned the second point, we, we all picked that up, that there's a static figure, you know, um, in, in the report. Um, I think Councillor Betts was going to ask a similar question, but it, it doesn't matter who asks it. If you come in, please, Matt. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Th thank you, Chair. Well, oh, my I'll... apologies to a fellow councillor. No, no, it's not okay. well, no, it was picked up by us all. Don't worry, don't worry. Yeah, and totally no acknowledge, acknowledge that. It's obviously Welsh Government grant, and it's, we, we are, you know, that's across the board, across Wales, in terms of the stagnation and that, and something we are challenging as a all local authorities in terms of that, but as you can, you know, the financial situation where we are um, from an all Wales perspective, it's, it's a difficult one, but, yeah. you know, they, they have ring fenced it, albeit, you know, inflationary pressures, it's a downward spiral on that, that cost profile. Because I actually wrote down, um, do you think that, the, that same question at the end, do you think that the funds provided are adequate? I mean, 
guessing the answer would be no, is it? Well, <laughs> based on a, on a temporary accommodation budget, I would say yes, because, no. you know, from that perspective, yeah, is it adequate, you know, right. but we only can, you know, deal with what we've got on the table from our perspective and it's best use of that, that, that finite resource from our, you know, okay. to go into the most people. Can we move on to point five, Mark? Because I think we're going through the old report here quietly, aren't we? And only, only, you know, uh, <laughs> do, do you want me to pick up the CPO element? Oh, go on, yeah, sorry, yeah. Councillor Jenkins' first point. Yeah, yeah in terms yeah, of sorry. The, uh, Councillor Jenkins, thank you for the question. Uh, slightly strain outside of the, the housing strategy, uh, but uh, yeah. from a CPO perspective, you talked about commercial buildings there, an aspect which is slightly different. Um, we work at Empty Properties Group dealing with residential properties, and CPO is, is on the agenda there. Um, specifically mentioned to the accommodation unit and the commercial street in my stick, you know, we are working very hard as an authority, albeit you can't see on the outside, but it's very challenging when a landlord, when you do works in default, etc., and then they come up and they pay the, the, the sum. But, you know, from that perspective, we've got to work with landlord and, and, and owners of properties and go through a process to ensure a probity and, and safeguard the authority. But it is a long process, but we, we have got that on the tool set. It's about following the five-stage strategy in terms of empty properties. And, and you know, we'll, hopefully we'll see some positive outcomes in one or two properties across the borough. Okay. Thank, thank you for that, Marty. And we have to move on. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, thanks Councillor Jenkins. Uh, point five... Uh, Question five, so point five, the action plan detail steps will be taken to deliver the strategy over four years. <laughs> Do you agree with the actions identified, albeit taken on Councillor Evans? We were having more of a sort of a smarter objective where we, yeah. in the final column, we've been a bit more. Yeah. If so some of this has been covered, we can, you know, we can move on. Is, yeah. um, has anybody got another question for this? Or are we happy with what's been said so far? There's no hands up, Martin. Quickly, as we jump on to point six. <laughs> So point six, is there anything missing from the action plan and what would you like to see included? Mm. I think we've captured quite a, quite yeah, a lot of comments. Yeah, so we've been covered in, in other stuff. Anybody got anything extra to say on um, on this point six? No? Okay. Oh, Councillor Martin. He, he does it every time, Martin. Morgan. <laughs> Councillor, Councillor Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. I, I did say I'd come back to it, and I don't know if I'll have another chance. So, no, go so on. Go away. This is my opportunity. I mean, we talked about thinking outside the box, and that was more to do with social housing rather than emergency accommodation. And, and, and I've thought a lot about um, the situation that occurred in, in the Atlantic Hotel last year. And it, clearly, those people were, were it seemed, minutes from, from sort of from disaster in their minds and 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 it you know there's two sides to this um we can't allow that to happen again for their sakes and, and for the sakes of people who didn't sleep trying to trying yeah, to sort it out yeah. but from a commercial side and i'm going to return back to something i've said a number of times since then we look at four million pound i think you said being spent on emergency accommodation and it, oh, i mean that's 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 an immense amount of money and so forget the, the Forget all the moral reasons for, 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 for why we're here and for housing people from a financial uh, position. That, that's not sustainable. Someone's making an awful lot of money out of that. And the return on that investment is, is enormous. Now, I, I, I'm not sure whether I heard these numbers somewhere or whether I dreamt them. But, but I, my understanding is that the, the revenue um, that we were paying out in this emergency accommodation in that instance would have paid back within about 18 months had we made a capital investment and, and i and i hope that that um when we consider everything outside the box that is top of the list because that is a really clear example of where we could invest potentially redevelop and then maybe move the thing on in in five years and, and move on to another property so you know i know i know i, I won't embarrass caris but caris has said before you can only spend the money once but there are instances where you can roll the money over and you, you're having the benefit of an, an improved um, building, an improved uh, environment and of course, you know, improved life chances for those uh, involved as well. Councillor Good, you indicated you'd like to respond, please. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I, 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 I absolutely agree, Councillor Williams, I think, and this is, this is where I've been asking the team to look at specifically in terms of becoming a property owning authority again this this is where i see actually that we could do it quicker with less risk actually at the point of need 
because I think, you know, what, what I would say is the team has done an amazing job in a very difficult situation to find accommodation for these individuals who, who need it at the point that they need it. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the Atlantic um, uh, and the hotels in Perth Call was a very unfortunate situation. As the councillor notes, uh, officers did stay up all night trying to find accommodation for all of those individuals. And it's something that we reflected as a, as a team afterwards is that we would not or we would do everything in our power to avoid ever being put in that situation again because it was not a good situation and the individual involved who tried to profitize from uh, those individuals difficulty i think is is deplorable um and and therefore while while we have i think had to simply due to resources focus on getting housing for individuals that need them. I do, I am ambitious that we look for longer term solutions because I think, you know, uh, having Airbnbs, I mean, for, for one, using Airbnbs simply is, is not built into our system. Karis and I have talked about it before. You know, we, we require sort of service level agreements with these people and, and most of these people are people who, who, you know, are Airbnb owners. They don't, they don't understand what is meant or what is required from um, an SLA, and they have to go through this entire procurement process when, when from their point of view, well, you've come to us and you've asked to use our holiday home to, to house these individuals. So um, I think what the team, what I've asked the team to look at is I think we all accept that the system isn't built for this and therefore needs to be reviewed. And beyond that, how do we build a system that if we take it as given that you know the the demand for housing isn't going to decrease anytime soon um and money pressures are going to become more significant um even with inflation now reducing we do need to find a long term solution so that is something we're looking at um i am keen that we look for accommodations where perhaps as as the council notes we own it put some money into it um as i mentioned previously have third sector partners to deliver some of the wraparound care, because I think what, what I wouldn't want is to, as I said earlier, run before we can walk, jump into delivering a service that, that ultimately the team isn't trained for. Um, but but it is something we're looking at and it's something we I, I recognise we need to have um, reform of. OK, thank you. You, you come content to that, Matt? Thank you. Um, so there's no hard further hands up. Um, Nobody wants to add anything from the officers? Anything you like, what would you like to say um, before we go, Martin? Just the fact that we were working on emergency legislation, uh, Chair, up until September 22, that's now in act and it's given us the time yeah. and the opportunity to think innovatively, as, as Councillor Williams has suggested, and supported by Councillor Good, really. I think now's the time we, with, with the housing support strategy to, to think about these opportunities. Excellent. We're going to go back to the report now. I just, again, again though, we'd like to extend the gratitude from the committee for the work on the Atlantic Hotel. Like we know the stress it caused. We had, a, we had an emergency meeting, so we don't want to be in that position again, do we? So let's hope that... Um, OK, um, so we've done... you finished your, con your um, consultation now, Martin, yeah? Well, the final question was just... Uh, oh, was a question, Sarah. I thought it, there was only six... It, sorry. Is there any... It, any any uh, further comments on the draft thousand sports strategy? I think we've captured quite a lot of these yeah, during yeah. this conversation. So I think you know that we we'll, we can feed that in as part of that consultation we're, process. We're going to have to jump back to the report now. With the framework which we've you know yeah. to go back to the beginning basically because yeah. we've missed a, you know some of this. A lot of it will have been covered, I guess, now as we go along. So hopefully we can we we'll through it fairly quickly because it would have taken some time otherwise. So I'm going to ask the committee now um, to go back two pages nine to thirteen of the re of the report and like, in item four. As um, we discussed before the meeting, in the pre-meeting, and um, any questions for the, which haven't obviously already been asked, because quite a few have, <laughs> in fairness. Any questions for the officers on page 9 to 12 of the, the cover report, firstly? Anybody? I don't see any hands up. No. Um, then okay, we'll go to Appendix 1, the report proper now then. Pages 15 to 37. Anybody got any questions on pages 15 to 37? I've got page 18 written down here. So somebody, Councillor Bledsoe, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. It's actually under Councillor Goods Forward. I was wondering if we could have a little bit more clarification on the, 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 the timescale of 22 to 26. 
at what point in 22 and what point in 26 does the strategy cover, please? Can Mark, uh, the officer's going to answer that. Yeah, yeah. Martin, please. Thank you. Yeah, so it's, it's a bit unusual, really, in terms of 22 to 26. We're looking back. So ultimately, due to the pressures the housing team were under in terms of support into the pandemic, we should initiate this dra draft strategy and implement it by 22. And unfortunately, we find ourselves here in September. September 23, actually, with a reflective strategy from 22 to 26. So that, that, is, that is the period it covers, 22 to 26. But, you know... What Council Bates was getting at, I think, is, is because it's is, is a reviews due, you know, during the, the actual... What actual month, then, let's say, of 22? Was it, was it January 21st, 22? Or it, did, it just says 22 to 26? What, what, uh, I'll, you know have, the, I'll have to come back on that one. I, I was. I'll, I'll, I'll make right, this yeah. assumption this financial year um, as oh, being financial year, yeah, yeah, yeah. on that basis. But we'll firm that up to make it. Yeah, it, it, it's just that point. It's just yeah. uh, we all appreciate the pressures and and the fact that it, we are post dating some of this. But it's just that point in which in part in 22 because it goes on to refer mm -hmm. to a a review two years in. And we just need to understand where that yeah. review will be because well, if it's if it's financial years, years so. then that review happens next May. Yeah, that's all it was. Well, yeah, let, we'll, let us know what that is. We'll acknowledge yeah. that. And obviously, we, we've given Welsh Government the draft draft strategy, and then we're going for a 12 week consultation, so it all adds time. But, you yeah, know, yeah. yes, uh, totally understand. We'll acknowledge Which that. Point of clarification more than anything else, that to uh, be fair. Uh, Councillor Manley Evans, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Obviously, that was something that I was interested in. So thank you that um, you, you give clarity on that. And also, you know, I mean, for me, it's all about reviewing it quite frequently because in life things change so quickly <laughs> as well. Um, mine is on um, 2.3. Um, and I've heard the discussion with regards to the RSLs earlier. And thank you very uh, much for clarifying a lot of that. However, it's mentioned in the report that the aims are to continue to improve working arrangements between the local authority and register and registered social landlords. What I'm interested in is how is the local authority improving working arrangements? How are these arrangements being monitored and measured? And how effective and efficient are they? Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the question, uh, Councillor Evans. In, in terms of monitoring, etc., from a monetary perspective, uh, the social housing grant is obviously overseen by Welsh Government and, and ratified that perspective, and that, that will give us the, the sort of audit trail with regards to that. In terms of you know officer engagement, etc., and with ourselves, we, we've set up uh, a, a meeting now in terms of officer-based regularly with uh, senior officers, chief execs, stroke uh, CMB members in terms of looking at demand, so building the relationship from top down. We have regular monthly uh, operational meetings with RSLs, all RSLs, in terms of understanding the, where the pressures are in terms of need, etc. And then in terms of proactive activity, our uh, rapid rehousing uh, protocol that Ryan can talk about is, is us working collaboratively with RSLs to, to minimise our temporary accommodation. So, and that's reviewing cases on a case-by-case -case basis. So we, we've really, we need the RSLs uh, to, to, to work with us on that basis. And I hope that demonstrates some of that collaboration. I don't want you to talk about the, the protocol, right? Yeah, I suppose just to put a bit of meat on the bones there, um, as Martin touched on, we, we meet with the registered RSLs on a monthly basis. Um, you know, ultimately they are, um, we talked a lot about investment and development, et cetera, but they're also our partners in terms of delivering the common housing mm -hmm. register. Um, so all the allocations, all the nominations, we work in partnership uh, on a daily basis there. So the monthly uh, meetings we have with the RSLs, whilst it's an opportunity to talk uh, strategically in terms of our demands going forward, it's, it's also an opportunity to make sure that, that actual day-to-day -day operations run smoothly um, and individual cases can be discussed there or, or individual properties can be discussed there at, at that forum. Okay, thank you. You could tend to that, Councillor Evans? Yeah, thank you. I just want to pick on the, up on the common housing register because you mentioned obviously you have these monthly meetings with the RSLs and obviously in July 23 there were 2,629 households on the common housing register and 59% waiting for the one bedroom properties of which you've actually explained again in the beginning of this presentation. I mean my concern at the moment is how long are these households on the waiting lists? 
And basically, what plans are there to do work with all relative bodies and organisations to reduce the waiting lists? Is there a target that you've set yourselves in order to reduce this waiting list? I think you may have touched on some of this previously, Mark, but can you can you put a bit of, uh, more detail on it? In terms please? of the Common Housing Register, Councillor Evans, it's, it's, ba it's banded in terms of priority right down to um, sort of not require an immediate uh, accommodation. So for, from our perspective, you know, where, where we see in presentations, our numbers grow in, you know, you know, it's, it's very difficult to mitigate. And if you, is, you know, when you, when you're not the, it's not in your gift in terms of having the properties as well, those two correlate very closely together. So supply and demand, I'd love to be able to house everyone on the common housing register. We don't go into housing, not to house people or support vulnerable um, households. Uh, it's you know it's been a really difficult time for the housing team in terms of that challenge, the, in, um, you know with the private rental sector re reducing because of aspects such as the re rent in the private sector versus the local housing allowance, which we challenge our government in terms of uplift on that because that's a real sort of stagnation for us. So to answer your question, Councillor Evans, I, I think you know it's very very difficult and where we are at the moment in terms of reducing those numbers. Um, you've seen the investment profile. Forty million pounds of the social housing grant from Welsh government, and we're talking mm -hmm. up to 600 units versus 2,600 households that need in accommodation right now. So, we're focusing on where we need in terms of priority mm -hmm. and and trying to minimise the amount of stay in temporary accommodation. But as the housing strategy points out, the, the length of time in temporary accommodation has increased as well. So, because we haven't got the move on accommodation, so we're in the perfect well of a storm really at where we are at the moment and I'd love to be able to say to you yes I can get those numbers down etc but the reality is the numbers are increasing and we don't have the units to offset those uh, numbers coming in. Okay, okay uh, Councillor Bletso please. Uh, thank you Mr Chair and I'd just like to come back to something that I mentioned during your presentation Martin about when you asked about uh, are we reflecting the challenges and um, I think most people know my background you know what I do as a day job my concern is something that Councillor Jenkins brought up before is, is related to the housing support grant and, and it is detailed on page 37, um, the actual amounts, but it's covered under 2.2 here on page 19. I don't find it acceptable that you as a department in this authority are being asked to do so much without an increase in the funding that comes with what you're required to do. Um, I speak to people who support those who deliver the housing support grant. And it's um, the phrase is being used is that those who are delivering the service, they now can no longer afford to pay minimum wage. So they are now having to choose to cut staff in order to pay minimum wage to deliver a service, which is fundamentally one of the most important that we do provide. I would like to see a greater um, detail given to how we're going to cope with this despicable freezing of, of the money, in my view, um, because I don't see how we can deliver more with less in this instance. Um, the people who deliver this service are phenomenal, who work under increasing pressure, and how we can't even afford to pay them minimum wages beyond me. Uh, so I'd like to know how we're going to deal with the housing support grant freezing going forward for the next three years, what we can do as an authority to try and ease that for you. Do we apply political pressure to the, the settlement? Do we write to Welsh Government and tell them that we have to have more because we can't deliver this service on their behalf? Um, and then if possible, I'd like to just come in as well on the Renting Homes Wales Act, um, which is covered on the following page, but under the same heading. Um, what page have you only You've jumped ahead a bit of you? Or no, 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 it's the same point. It is, it is, it is on the same point. What page is it, sorry? Uh, it's on page 20 and uh, 2.1. Right. right, OK, got to um, okay, yeah. The strategy one, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the, it's at the top of page 20. Yeah. Um, the Renting Homes Wales Act now provides for six months' notice for a no-fault eviction from a landlord to a tenant, um, which the spirit of the law is based around giving local authorities more time to, to deal with intervention services. Uh, but the reality is, is that the, all the departments across Wales, not in this authority, across Wales are under so much pressure, they're literally telling people to go away and come back when there's five weeks to go. Um, so I would like to know where we are in relation to uh, the six months. Uh, is there a realistic expectation that we can engage with all parties in relation to prevention on this at the six month notice to try and adhere to the spirit of the regulations that was brought in last November? Thank you, Chair. Over to you, Mark. 
Well, do, you, you didn't, I didn't see you in the game, sorry. Oh, it's all right. I, I just thought I'd come back to the first point and, and leave it to Martin to come yeah, back yeah, on the, the second point. Um, uh, obviously, money from, from Welsh Government grants is, is difficult at the moment. Um, it is something, just to reassure Councillor Blatt, so it is something that is raised regularly in the WLGA cabinet meetings with housing cabinet members. Um, it is something that across Wales, um, you know, regardless of party, is brought up within these meetings. Uh, the minister is very aware of it. I think, you know, the, the minister would say that she's very aware that there's a housing crisis in Wales and we want to do as much as we can. And we, ha are, are, as local authority cabinet members, have, you know, said to the minister, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> Um, I, and I believe it is the right policy that we have uh, no one left out policy, but that does cost okay. money. And, and of course, you know, with with inflation being what it is, it's not just you know every, every service costs more money to deliver, and and therefore also the people working in those um, those services need to be paid more. And that is an issue. It has been raised. Um, and I'm sure that it'll be continue to be raised uh, in those meetings that we have um, every, I think, every two months. Uh, but just to reassure um, Councillor Besser that it is raised regularly. Thank you for that reassurance. Was good. Martin, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of our housing support grant, um, echo your words in terms of the stagnation. Um, the, the reality is that 70% of that is is goes to the third sector and Ryan can talk far more eloquently in terms of how what we're doing in terms of making those sustainable contracts with the third sector but in picking up on the rent and homes wheeled act uh, I think your synopsis of of the challenge of six months is, is quite true it's not that we turn people away but that's where we are and you know we got someone that physically presents us with no accommodation at all versus someone that's sitting in a potential eviction it, it's really really difficult the way we do we do have to balance that sort of uh, priority uh, in terms of that need but you know acknowledge you know the ethos of the act and, and the challenge we're in so it's a difficult one sorry so Ryan do you want to talk about what we do in the third sector yeah uh thank you Councillor Petzl for I suppose helping to highlight what what you've already said is a is a massive issue in uh, particularly third sector providers in this arena there's a lot of um I suppose publicity and media given to the care sector isn't there but it's very similar issues within uh, the housing related support sector I suppose just to provide some some reassurances whilst we'd love an increased housing support grant budget and we'd continue to advocate that to Welsh Government. Ultimately, we've got to work with what we're given at the same time. Um, and we engage with our uh, commission providers on a, on a regular basis, uh, weekly, monthly. You know, There's a very open dialogue between myself and the team and the providers and uh, finances are part of those conversations. Um, we did quite a big exercise a couple of years ago when we did um, actually have a housing support grant uplift uh, a few years ago and, and kind of made sure that all our all our contracts etc were were uplifted accordingly um it wasn't we, we, i suppose it was important for us not to see that uplift as, as all about new services but also um enhancing and rewarding the services that we already did deliver um there's a few kind of measures that are in place to make sure that uh, that those kind of assurances are there um one being how kind of tight really our procurement uh, processes are and how um, we've essentially got a, a rolling basis of commissioning uh, contracts, where which essentially means that the no service um, that we commission goes around three years or so without being uh, reviewed or extended or, or recommissioned. And those exercises, um, whilst providers sometimes, you know, um, cases for going through them, they do allow a complete refresh of the contract essentially and a, and a retender of, of rates, etc., which, which some local authorities um, don't do maybe as tightly as us so um i'm pretty confident that we've got no uh contracts commissioned by bridgen that are in a deficit from a housing support grant perspective um and i think we've got open relationships with the providers as if there was those concerns about genuinely as you've mentioned kind of not being able to to fund the staff at the rate they're legally allowed to do so i'm pretty sure we've got the relationships so that we can have that open conversation um around that and work together to to deal with those issues um, and just I suppose just to touch on the Rent and Homes Act as, again, I, I, I just to relate what Martin said. I think it's not so much about people being turned away at six months. I think the issue being that 
the solutions that may have been there once upon a time in terms of being able to prevent those uh, situations getting worse within six months maybe are, are less so. So it's actually taken far longer than six months to re resolve a situation. It's not so much people are being turned away in terms of access and support. It's just that the tools that those support services have got are somewhat blunt compared to what used to be with the limited access to private rental sector. And we've talked about the, the weights for social housing, etc. Before we bring Martin in, we've got a little dilemma now. It's it's coming up for half past five, you know. We, we need to call a break at some point. Well, we, we've got more than half of this this report to go through yet. So do we have a quick break now? Or do we, or do we trundle on to the end of the report? It's, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be... So I'm just going to look at the guidance in the committee. Anybody like to... I know, you know it's awkward for officer. I'd rather finish this report and then take the break, but it's we just you know because of the, the we didn't know who was going to do the presentation, Martin. Nothing wrong with that, but it's eating into the time now. So I'm going to have to call a break. We can't go on indefinitely. So I'm going to call a break, Martin. I'll bring you in now. We'll do that, and we're going to go a quick break then, just a comfort break, and then come straight back. So apologies, uh, officers. There's only way we can do it. Sorry, they insisted on having breaks. You know, so Martin, please. Thank you, Chair. This, this this will probably be something to ponder over the break, really. I mean, we 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 discuss, I mean, it's on page 22, but it's, it could be anywhere within this strategy. Um, the need, the demand, uh, uh, and and we've talked a lot about meeting that demand with supply. Uh, I don't see a huge amount about prevention and and perhaps reducing the demand. Uh, I and this is complex, really complex, isn't it? Because we're not talking just about rough sleepers, which is very complex. We're talking about people who become homeless. I, through you know experience, have seen people whose um, journey to homelessness has almost been inevitable. You've almost seen it uh, unfold over 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 twelve months or so, and 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 for various complex reasons, it's not uh, an inability to 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 um, to halt that. It's sometimes that person doesn't seem to be able to see the wood for the trees. Uh, and it's not that they can't get a job, or they, but they don't have a job. And there's all of these very complex things. I, I, I don't know really quite, I've got the question yet. I'm quite formulated yeah. it probably. Yeah. But, but what as an authority do we do and what can we do? And if we haven't got the powers, what more could we do to, to help prevent that? Because again, each one of these situations is, is, is a personal tragedy, but of course it's costing us an awful lot of money as well. And, and so, you know, what, what are we doing in, in, you know, to, to, to sort of suppress the demand, if you like? Preventative measures. Preventative measures, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Martin, anything? I think we touched upon it a little bit earlier in terms of the, the, the multi-agency or multi-sector sort of uh, process in terms of resolving and mitigating this, because, you know, it's a very chaotic scenario in homelessness in terms of multifaceted in terms of mental health, drug, alcohol, and that, that's the big challenge, isn't it, uh, that you alluded to, Councillor William. So, one one of the priorities there is priority four in terms of to improve the collaboration of key stakeholders to a strategic level to improve homelessness prevention. And that's it. It's not just about housing. It's about a multi-agency approach um, and multi-sector. You know, with predominant uh, focus around health as well has been the key thing. And and that the project that uh, Ryan commissioned with the other commission partners across the, the Comtaf Morgano um, board is is that step towards that multifaceted support. For those individuals, it, it, it's an up and down journey, isn't it? You know, I mean, it's a revolving door in terms of support, and the, the difficulty is, you take one step forward and two steps backwards. But it's about us; we're always there, available to support that person or that household in terms of that issue. Coast to good. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just, just to add to that, I think what what we can't forget in this is the sort of wider societal question that comes about. I mean, a lot of the individuals uh, that end up. Uh, requiring housing who find themselves homeless are often um, of uh, slight, uh, slightly older than the middle age, often from relationship breakdowns. And we, we now live in a world where the reality is if you bought a home with a partner um, at some point 20 years ago and find yourself uh, having a relationship breakdown, the money that you can get from that equity no longer is enough to sustain you as an individual moving out of that relationship and that is where where we 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 struggle i think and i think it's very hard for um you know with the with the best team in the world and, and all the money in the world 
to find solutions to that. Um, and so, you know, there, there will always be obviously situations where we can mitigate and spot individuals who are at risk of homelessness and try and prevent that. But, but honestly, an awful lot of people who require housing across Wales, across the UK, and certainly within this borough, are from circumstances that I don't think anyone predicts, that then snowball into a situation where, where they really are struggling. Um, and, and I think that is just very difficult to, to deal with and, and, and requires a far wider societal response than, yeah, you, than something we can deliver. And the services are picking that up, hopefully, you know, before it sort of gets to Mart. Anyway, you know, that would be the hope. R yeah, Ryan? Yeah, just to add to what Councillor Goods just said, really, is, is one example, but I think generally what we're seeing is more people coming through the system who maybe a few years ago would have been able to prevent the situation themselves. Yeah. And that's probably far wider than our control things like lha rate freezes um cost of living crisis etc it goes on really um but what we're seeing is a, is a massive uh, amount of in, increase in presentations of, of people who um with, with the best will in the world it, it's, it's really difficult to prevent um i suppose what prevent what our priority at uh number four uh, in page 33 aims to to kind of achieve is is as Martin touched on a, a cross sector a, a wider ownership of of housing and homelessness because as you, as you touched on uh, councillor you know you sometimes you can spot these people maybe a year ahead um, you can see there's issues going on with someone's life um, that, that that you can quite easily probably say oh that person's going to end up being homeless in six months twelve months but it's not always the homelessness department or the housing department who sees those individuals it could be health services it could be RSLs it could be whatever it could be education services and i think what we are seeking to achieve through through a wider collaboration with with stakeholders is a greater ownership um and a greater um involvement i suppose from a cross-sector approach and that's something that welsh gov try to um try to achieve as well in in terms of um preventing where we can but i think it, it is true that we should acknowledge that actually there's there's a lot more in circumstances now where where people, you know, probably would have been prevent previously and, and now can't really. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to bring it to a halt there, uh, guys. It's 7:34. A, a quick six minutes. We'll come back at 22. Just for just two. We don't be dragging out quick toilet, you no know, coffee and back. Yeah, is that okay? So we could uh, stop recording. News. Thank you for that, everybody. Thank you.